sorry. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, wow, it's really echoes, really echoes in here. Um, uh, right, some housekeeping. For, I'm Paul Worrell, by the way. So I've uh, organised this meeting um, in the last three or four weeks. Uh, so it's all very new to me as well. A um, bit of housekeeping now. Um, if there's an issue firewise, you just go down the way that came in down the, the stairs. Um, the, w's, the, the toilets are, uh, I think there's a, uh, uh, you go upstairs one flight and they're up there. Okay, so as I say, my name's Paul Worrell. This is the first solid London meetup. Um, I uh, was uh, talking to somebody a few weeks ago, it's Marcus actually, and he pinged me and said, Do you know anything about this solid? I said no, and then obviously, as I've explained, <laughs> I'm suddenly standing here. So, um, speakers tonight, we've got myself, I just wanted to tell you the, the route that I've taken to end up uh, organising the meeting tonight. And we've then got um, Ruben uh, Vergoff, or Vergoss, I don't know exactly, Ruben, how do I pronounce Vergoss or Vergoff? As you want, but just Ruben's fine. Oh, just Ruben's fine, okay. We have Ruben who's going to actually talk to us about solid itself. Um, we've then got Pat McBennett here from uh, Inrupt, who's going to talk about this uh, startup that Sir Tim Berners Lee and John Bruce um, have put together to sort of commercialise um, and provide commercial services around Inrupt. Um, and then we have Nikita Baxalia. Yeah, just to get fine. <laughs> okay, Nikita, who's going to talk about Solid at Mainsafe. So, funny enough, uh, Mainsafe. Um, there's a little bit of congruence with what I've been doing recently in the blockchain space and crypto assets. So it was really funny and exciting to hear that Solid is being used by you guys, okay? So it brings two uh, routes um, that I've been involved with together. But I'm going to introduce uh, myself first, just for 10 minutes, and then I'll pass you on to Ruben. So I've had an interesting journey over the last few years. Um, I actually was working at JP Morgan Chase um, where I was doing a lot of stuff with Semantic Web. I built the development team there. Um, we were working on RDF, RDFS, a bit of OWL, um, obviously the Sparkle language, and in particular um, seeing if we could get triple stores um, into production. And if you've worked in an investment bank, you'll realise change and innovation is difficult. So it did actually take um, about 18 months to, to actually get a triple zone into production, and we did. I don't know whether it's still there. Um, it wasn't doing that much, but we did achieve it, <laughs> right? So, um, now, at the time, this was back in sort of 2012, 2013, um, everybody was interested in big data. Um, they, they were, they unstructured data, that was it, unstructured, and this stuff is structured, okay? So, um, we weren't that popular, it wasn't a hot topic like Hadoop, in fact, I mean, does, is Hadoop still around? I don't know, right, but it is. But then it was a very hot topic, and we were sort of a bit boring, um, you know, modeling and metadata and things like that wasn't uh, very inspiring for people. So I was a bit disappointed by that, but I did find a really useful use case um, in managing enterprise software. So I, I left in uh, JP Morgan Chase in 2014, and I spent a year with a couple of other guys um, working on something called sparkycode.com. Um, you can go there, the SSL certificate is uh, uh, expired, um, but if you go there you'll see that actually um, it was a really interesting application of the technology for managing uh, uh, software. Okay? So uh, we had all of these knowledge bases, uh, lots of uh, tools that would produce um, you know, uh, uh, Git uh, uh, knowledge bases, uh, actual the code itself would be uh, produced going through the uh, abstract syntax uh, tree, um, so you can literally query code and query who'd worked on it and you could traverse the uh, dependency graph as well. And I, I really did discover some very interesting things when I was working on that product. But we didn't get an early adopter and uh, as sort of a software entrepreneur you have to cut your losses and say okay that didn't quite work. So I was disappointed to do that but I, I, I did. Um, at the time we actually had an issue in our own family around identity theft. And um, so I suddenly thought, hmm, can I not solve that problem? So I got involved in cryptography, um, trying to produce an app that would help people secure what they were doing, and then we suddenly ended up in the blockchain space and the crypto assets. 
Um, so that's Zonified, that's currently the uh, uh, project that we're currently working on. And um, we're focused on uh, helping people work together to secure activities. And we're using Ethereum as a smart contract uh, uh, network. You know, what's really interesting is we're focused not on data, but on proving that the data is correct and the claims in the data <coughs> um, is valid. Right. So I took a design decision right at the beginning, which is kind of the opposite to what I would normally have done. Okay, I decided I was going to ignore data completely. And so every time I went to see an organisation, I would say, look, this is how the product works. Um, you can see the, the test and the validity of certain data, but how you receive and process the data is completely up to you. So we have the way that big red circle is, um, I ignored, and that caused me a lot of problems. Every time I saw an organisation, they always saw everything solved through the prism of data. Okay? Um, and they wanted as much data as they can, obviously, and I was the opposite. So I hadn't solved that problem. I didn't know how I was going to solve that problem. Um, but what happened at the end of last year, we were approached by central government saying that your business model is a very good... <laughs> is a very good, um, the way your business model works is a very good example of how we see uh, Gov.uk Verify going. And if you don't know Verify, it's the way that the UK government um, uh, identifies uh, people for the use of online services. So uh, there's one particular vision that they have which is about identity proof over time. And um, so this is about sharing uh, uh, identity verifying events. Okay, and that's what basically what we were doing. We were capturing these events. Um, there's a, an organization called the Open Identity Exchange, where sort of a neutral place where organizations go to talk about identity and uh, look for various uh, solutions. And they've got a project called um, Building a Trusted Environment, uh, which we're going to be contributing to as of next week. And um, the project itself is all about sharing due diligence events between organisations so that everyone's not replicating that process over and over again. Now, um, as we, I've started looking at that project, there were certain requirements that were coming out, and I, I suddenly realised, um, ah, OK, this is getting me back to where I was before. Um, we, we needed to, to um, declare semantics and understand what uh, uh, we were trying to do. We needed a vocabulary, um, we needed a communication protocol, we aspired it to be a completely decentralised solution. I say, I'm saying it as if it's done, it's not done, these are just a, a series of requirements. Okay? And we want it to be technology neutral, um, obviously privacy, privacy focused, but most importantly when it comes to identity, as I'm learning, as I get more and more into it, is um, it's the legal frameworks that are important. The relying parties need to know um, what's their accountability, what's their responsibility, what they can and cannot share, um, etc. So these are the requirements of the project. So I started thinking about okay, how we, how could we, how could I encourage this project to adopt a really good uh, approach to. to technically to defining this stuff and I immediately went back to Sparkle. I'm not expecting people to understand what I've got up on the screen there. But I started to look at uh, something called triples, um, look at uh, how to create statements on statements, to have events around certain uh, changes in attributes around people and things like that. Um, and then how I could use the language Sparkle and uh, uh, to, to, to query our blockchain uh, to, to resolve what we call the zero knowledge proofs and then be able to prove certain parts of this um, data around people okay? and do that on a historical uh, basis. So I started exploring it, so suddenly I'm back into thinking um, RDF, RDFS and Sparkle. Um, and then uh, Marcus Booman pinged me and said, Paul, um, have you seen Solid? I said, no, I don't know anything about Solid. So I had a quick look. I was really pleased to see it was building on this uh, uh, structured data concept. Um, but they have the concept of um, a, a pod, which uh, Pat and Ruben will explain. And so this is, um, from a public, the public's point of view, it's this little data space that they have and they control. Um, so I started to imagine, well, they're going to have uh, claims in there, certain attributes describing themselves, that are going to need 
from the relying party's point of view, some form of proof. Okay, so this is where I have arrived. Um, we started this uh, meetup because there seemed to be nothing going on in the UK yet. Maybe I preempted plans. I, I don't know, Pat. Um, um, but this is this is where I'm seeing myself, and I'm, we're seeing Zonified as being able to um, uh, attest to data that's in these pods. Okay. We're also seeing that the pods might not just be personal data, but they might be company data and small business data and things like that. Right, so on that basis, <laughs> what is solid? And I'll pass on to Ruben. Um, so if you give him a... Give him a mic. Um, the Olympics took place in London, and in this ceremony, there was this guy who didn't say anything, we just <coughs> sent a tweet. And this was a tweet. This is for everyone, sent by Tim Berners-Lee. Many people didn't know who he was, let alone that most people understand what was actually meant. So what Tim really meant here is that the World Wide Web is meant to work for everyone. So it's about global access to the web. It's about access independent of where you come from, how you use the web, and so on. But it's also about using the web of your own conditions. And it's also about inviting everyone to help us build the web. So there's this vision of, of this, this open web for everyone where we can do whatever we want. But as you know, um, it's not always that nice. Um, we have seen interesting things happen lately. But if you're not on Facebook, it doesn't count. If you don't tweet about it, it doesn't exist. All of those things. So this web, this idea of openness, um, has, well, has sometimes been replaced a bit by only a handful of platforms that dictate how the world and the web work, basically. And Tim would meet Tim if he didn't think about solutions as well. And the solution I'm going to is solid. And simply said, solid is about choice. So if you remember one word, let it be choice. Solid aims to give us back our choice on the web. And it does that by redefining the relationship between people, services, platforms, companies, and their data. And more specifically, we're going to try to move that data closer to people. Because right now, it's very, very close to companies. So we need to take back control of that data. I've got three parts for you today. First, I'll start about this idea of universality of the web and how this enables innovation. Then we'll talk a bit about this relationship between apps, data, and people. And finally, I'll zoom into the developer experience, how we can build things on solid. So let's first talk a bit about universality and what exactly the problem is that we're trying to solve with solid. The web strives to be universal. So universality is actually one of the important drivers of the web. And it's something I didn't realize until I got really close to the web. It's the unspoken assumption, basically. It means that anyone should be able to use the web regardless of the hardware you use to browse the web, regardless of the software you have. And it also means that developers are free to innovate. Because if you don't have this freedom, this universality, then innovation depends on specific hardware or specific software. Thanks to the web, if you just build for the web, it runs everywhere the web also runs. So this shows that this universality is basically the one constant, the one thing driving the web. Universality brings freedom of expression, the whole anyone can say anything about anything principle. So we all have our own spaces, so we don't necessarily have to agree on different things. And this is good. right? Um, because if someone has an opinion, well, we don't need to copy that opinion, we can just link to it even if we disagree. So it's not a consensus model like, let's say, blockchain and so on. No, we can just all say what we want in our own space and link to what others are saying. And what resulted is that just anyone could start a block anywhere on the web. You could have your own space. You could say whatever you want, the error of blocks, if you still remember. It's been a while. And a whole generation of social platforms helps people do these things. Like, you don't have to be an expert to start a blog or to share your photos online. You can go to one of those platforms. And that was back then seen as a good thing, but this also is where things start going wrong a little bit. But let me not get ahead of myself. A very important concept as well is permissionless innovation. And this is kind of the innovation counterpart of freedom of expression. So anyone can say anything about anything, but anyone can build anything for any reason, and you don't need anyone's permission. You can just build a website, go on the web, and you can sell or create whatever you want online. That's your freedom. If you say, well, actually, that is what I expect, just a reminder, in App Store, this is not the case. 
if you want to be in the App Store, you have to have the permission of Apple. Certain kind of apps will not be allowed. So permission as an addition is quite unique to the web. And again, this has brought a lot of creativity in the world. Things like Uber, eBay, Twitter, Amazon, they're all things that we couldn't have imagined 15 years ago, 20 years ago maybe. Um, but today they're very normal, they become the new normal. Like of course if I'm in London and I want to go somewhere, I just get an Uber, right? It's, it's that simple. I can just get things delivered to my doorstep. All concepts are so normal today that the web has enabled through permission as innovation. Now the problem is that somewhere along the way, our data to do all of these things has become centralized in only a handful of platforms on the web. Things that used to be on people's personal websites and blogs are now on Facebook and Twitter. And we have to admit, these platforms are responsible for a great user experience, but at the same time, we lost control. Which is kind of a hard price to pay maybe for user experience. This of course has far-reaching consequences uh, for privacy, but let's be honest, if people really, really care about privacy, they would be on there. So I'm not going to talk about privacy today. And what is more important to me is that it endangers the web's universality. So you'll see things like, well, if you want to see this, you need to sign up with Facebook. Um, and even worse, like, well, Facebook works better than the native app, so they just try to you know, get you off the web and, and, and get you inside of a saddle. So these are the real dangers to me. And this, of course, creates the walled gardens, which you've probably heard about, like the, the silos of content. Um, and, yeah, very simply said, if you want to share a picture on Facebook with your colleagues on, well, let's say LinkedIn or MySpace, um, you have to move the picture or you have to move the people. Right? You cannot just communicate over the silos walls, basically. And that's quite troublesome, because this goes against the this is for everyone notion. Right? If it truly were for everyone, it wouldn't matter on which of those networks you were, you would still be able to share, but you're not today. This is really limiting what we can do on the web. <coughs> this massive centralization hurts diversity, it hurts innovation, it hurts choice. Because let's be honest, if we have to build one integration, if we have a budget for just one, Will it be Facebook.com or something very private? I mean, of course we integrate with Facebook, it's logical. Does it also mean that developers start depending on those centralized platforms for data and identity? And if you don't want to depend on Facebook, you have to become the next Facebook. That, that's a kind of the spirit that we have currently, but that doesn't work. And so people lose control of their data. It's also bad for developers and businesses because it means that people won't move to your app <coughs> even if your app is better because they're locked in. Their data is the reason why they stay on those platforms. So those are all the threats happening to universality and innovation on the web. So let's think about a new relationship between apps, data, and people to fix this. So again, so this is like choice, right? And what kind of choice is it? Well, so it enables people to pick the apps that they want to use while independently giving them the choice of storing their data wherever they want. That's it. This very simple principle has quite some deep consequences, I can see. But that's all it is. So people control their own data, and, whoops, a little too fast, they can share the device <coughs> and the people they choose. That's it, that's the essence. But from this essence, a lot of interesting things follow. So let's start with a social media example. We don't emphasize Solid is not a social media platform. Solid is much broader than social media. However, I'm giving these examples because they're so universal again. But try to think out of the box. Try to apply it to your use case in your mind. So this is a view that we're very familiar with. And today, a view like this one, all pieces of data you need for it typically come from one place. And this is a Facebook post, well, the data comes from Facebook, <coughs> right? With Solid, if we indeed make a choice, if we separate apps from data, this means that every single data point here can come from a different place. If this is my post, well, this picture is going to be <coughs> in my personal data vault, my data pod, so we call it Solid. This text is going to be stored in my data pod. If you react to what I write, well, this reaction is yours. It's going to be stored in your data pod. And even a piece of data as small as a like. If you like my post, well, the like is yours. It's going to be stored in your data pod. So if you like this one, very quickly, ends up being built up of hundreds of different data pods that could come from anywhere on the web. So that's very different. What does this mean now for people? Well, on the left-hand side, this is what we have today. We have centralized web applications, and you can see that basically an app is a combination of an app and data. They're interwoven with each other, you can't separate them easily. And this has a couple of consequences. As I said before, in the walled gardens, I cannot share across boundaries, so that's, that's a pity. They all have to have copies of the data or of the people. 
Um, it also means that there's synchronization problems. For instance, if I accept an event in this app, the other app won't know about it. So what happens all the time is we're just sending our data around and around again. And just to give you a different example, um, let's say governments, for instance, well, they work the same thing. Like if you talk with agency A, you have to give that data. If you talk with agency B, you have to give the same data again. Because you know, they're all creating copies of this. But so then, we say, well, let's do this differently. But the personal data part, this is where your data goes. So if you want to store something, you store it in your space. That's a simple answer. And those apps you see here, they're actually the same apps that you see on the left-hand side, but the data has been pushed out. The data is now in data pump. So apps instead become a kind of views on top of personal data, which means that I can start with one app and I can continue with another without losing. So if I suddenly don't like an app anymore, I can just switch. It also means that the apps that I'm using can be different from the apps that you're using, and we can still talk to each other, because we communicate through the data, not through the app that holds our data. So this is a choice happening right here. I choose where my data is, I choose which apps I use, and it's an independent choice, it's also independent of the choice that you have to make. So good for people, also good for privacy, because I can decide exactly which apps and which people get to see which parts of my data. But the thing is, it's not just about privacy or people, it's also about innovation. Because if we separate those things, we'll again have permissionless innovation. Again, left-hand side is today, Today we have a single market for centralized apps, which means that we have a competition based on who has most data. It doesn't matter if you're the worst app, if you have most data, you will win. This is very troublesome for innovation because, first of all, those companies don't innovate anymore. If anyone can name me an excellent innovation that Facebook has done in the past 10 years to your newsfeed, please tell me. I said 10 years. This is terrible. Disrupting Western democracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Really cool. yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Was that purpose? No, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, fair enough. But that didn't get us very far, did it? Um, and then, it's only one innovation in 10 years. So, even more. My point being that they don't need to innovate. And also, they're afraid to change the experience because that's what people are used to. They innovate with data harvesting processes, they innovate on how much data they collect. The opposite is also true. If someone wants to do innovation, if I want to build a feature people have wanted for a long time, like give me a slider to see more content I agree or disagree with. Facebook won't build it, well I could build it. The thing is, I don't have the data. I can never enter the market because this is not a competition for the market. But so that this changes because you get a competition on two levels. On one hand, you get a competition between apps. On the other hand, you get competition between storage solutions. And this competition is not a winner-takes-all competition. Different niches can work here. For instance, the Facebook app, the Twitter app, they're all built for the average user. Grandmothers use the same app as their grandchildren, which is insane. But the only reason they do it is because, well, that's where the data is. If you want to see your grandchildren's pictures, you have to be on that platform. That's how it works. Whereas here, you can imagine that apps get tailored more specifically to certain kinds of people. We get to choose the app we like most independently if our data is stored. So I don't think that people will be convinced like Comte is solid, there's more privacy. But we're going to get a better experience because there's going to be better competition. And I believe that this better experience is what will draw them in. This is how it should work. Same thing on the data storage market as well. Like it's going to be providers that are free, there's going to be providers for which you can pay. And that's fine. I'm not saying that people need more privacy, I'm saying they need more choice. Right now I can go to Facebook and say, well, here's 10 quid a month, but please don't mind my data. <coughs> this kind of choice for me to create. So that was all the theory. Now Solid, let's try it concretely. Well, Solid is not a platform, so don't um, say it's a Facebook alternative or a Twitter. It's not any alternative. It's an ecosystem, foremost. It's a way of building apps that's different than we do today. It's an ecosystem in the sense that we have standards that realize the interoperability that we need. It's a movement in the sense that we want to shift the way in which people build apps. It's also a community in the sense that it's a collection of people, companies, organizations who want to build this together. So that's what sort of this an ecosystem, not just a platform to replace anything else. And anyone can build or host software for Solid. Yeah. You can have a server at home if you want, maybe at your workplace. Um, you can just rent server space on the web, or you can use one of the free servers. Basically, 
Having a solid part is like having a website. It can live anywhere, so that kind of choice you get. So your server acts as a data part and it will store and guard your data. So what kind of data can there be there? Well, it's just a regular web server, but we add support for access control and support for linked data. So it being a regular web server means it's um, application agnostic. So just like a web browser doesn't mandate what kind of websites you have, um, you can build any application on top of solid pods. And it is like a website, except that um, instead of being page-oriented, it's data points oriented Your data can be opened with any app, just like a website can be opened with any browser. And what kind of data is a data pod? Well, basically anything you can imagine. Um, think about profile data, pictures, comments, likes, um, videos, like whatever you want to create. Medical records, like it's a very private space, so anything, any piece of data about you, you can store there. <coughs> we only have the sort of clients and the browser apps or native apps that interact with the data pods. So the idea is that people give apps permission to see certain parts of the data pod. You give other people permission to do the same thing, and then basically apps will give you a unified experience. So one of you will have an app, and you can see your own data and other people's data in the same experience. So they all will be blended together if you have been given permission. So what kind of apps can we imagine? Well, again, permission is an innovation. It could be a calendar app, uh, we could build a new doodle on swap, we could build a social feed, we could do photo sharing, we could do something very specific like organizing conferences, not like this one. Like anything you can imagine, you can build, just like on the web. And the good thing is, you don't need data for it. Because nowadays as developers, the first thing, the first question you have, how are we gonna get the data we need to do things? Well, it's solid, you don't need to do that. You just ask people permission to see what's already there. And this <coughs> simplifies that development a lot. Which brings me to the last part, um, the developer experience. How are people going to build on top of Solid? So, building apps on Solid is conceptually much more complicated. Like what happens today is that one app is built for a specific backend, another app for another backend. With Solid, different apps will combine data from many different places. So we need a simple way to do that. And a couple of challenges, and we solve them with linked data. For instance, if we all store our own data, how can we connect it to others' data? How can apps share data without having to agree on everything first? And how can we integrate data from multiple data pods? Because clearly you're going to have to do it all the time. Well, linked data is around, so let me quickly show you how linked data works. For instance, this is JSON-LD, it's a piece of linked data. This is me liking this meetup. And you know what? This meetup didn't even have a like button, I still liked it. And I could do that because this is my piece of data. So this is a piece of data stored in my data pod. This is an identifier for myself, this is my web ID. This is the meetup, and I just connect those pieces together. So my like links to this meetup. That's how it works. I don't need this meetup's permission to like it. I can do anything because this is my own space. <coughs> so this is how I can say something about any piece of data on the web. The second thing is like how are we going to make apps agree on what this has to look like, of course. And this is what we do through data shapes and, and, and semantics. I mean, we can have long discussions about this, but the core idea is that um, apps recognize shapes. So in this case, there's going to be an app there specifically to recognize likes. They can display all of my likes. And it doesn't need to know about everything else in my data pod. It will just have this very narrow view of recognizing the pieces it knows how to deal with. Instead of having to agree on everything, apps can just have very small local agreements um, on how things work. <coughs> and the final question was around integration, and the good news is that linked data is, has been made for this kind of case. So if I'm liking this and Hall is also liking this, well, we can just concatenate all of those things and build a small graph. So linked data is not like objects that are local and encapsulated, it's actually a graph of things you can just keep on concatenating and connecting. This is how we do cross pods and things as well. And building the developer experience is, in our opinion, going to be a crucial factor in, in, in success, obviously, because we're not going to try to build for end users directly. Let's try to build for developers, and developers are the ones who will do the innovation. And especially front-end developers are the people who build the apps that others see. So together with UX designers, they will be the ones bringing the solid experience to people. It's not up to well, us, like a small solid core team, to do this. It's really up to us to help others build for solid. And if we enable developers, we have to save them also enable ourselves. Because if we make it easier for them, it becomes easier for us. And there's a beautiful quote about this, because, you know, a lot of rumors um, 
are being told about RDF, most of them are right. But I think this one captures it very good. Like people think RDF is a pain because it's complicated, but the truth is even worse. RDF is painfully simplistic, but it allows you to work with real-world data and problems that are horribly complicated. And we should forget that what we're doing is very complex, like we're building up a view with hundreds of pieces of data from all across the web. So this is a complicated problem. Of course, it's going to be complicated technology to solve this, but that doesn't mean we have to expose all the complexity to app developers. Right? And when thinking about app developers, um, I think I remember as a cool kids because I've, I've been in an audience of app developers sometimes and I just feel so old and boring because they're doing fancy things like React and Vue.js and Angular and so on and there we are with our old RDF-based stacks. So if you want this to be successful, we have to talk the same language. So this is why I've been working, for instance, on building solid apps with React. And this is what it looks like. It looks like, you know, well, if you're logged in, welcome, user of first name. This is very simple to write, but actually underneath there's a lot of complexity that we deal with because if you use a first name, you're actually getting the user's profile from the web, getting their first name, filling it out. But the developer doesn't need to know. So you can get a user's profile image, you can get a link to their inbox, and you can even, and this is interesting, get a list of the first names of their friends. Why is this interesting? Well, it's saying, actually, because those first names are stored in different places. So, um, how this works concretely is at first it will go to the user, get a list of their friends, which is stored in the user's pod, then go to those pods of those friends to get their current first name. Of course, a person's first name doesn't change a lot, I know, but if you put profile picture right there, it gets more interesting because I don't have to store all their profile pictures, they'll just come from the web. So, this is the kind of way we want to think about building things for, for solid, right? We want to make it um, very easy and we don't want to force people to think in different ways. We want them to use the same primitives already. <laughs> Basically, I won't ask developers to understand RDF. I just want them to understand linked data. But this data is on the web and goes to the area. What we've seen um, within Rupt actually is if we show LinkedIn to the front of developers, at first they were a bit overwhelmed, but actually, once they got the hang of it, after a couple of days, they were like, actually, this is much easier because I don't need to have everything. If something's missing, it will just come to me from the web. And it was very liberating for them in a way. And, and now they're just doing it. So it's not that hard as we think, if we're able to, of course, give them the right abstraction data. So we've talked about universality and how that's being threatened by current business models. We also talked about redefining this relation between people, um, apps, and the data. So bringing the data closer to people. And we've talked about how crucial the decentralized developer experience will be because Conceptually, it's much more difficult, but if we tackle it the right way, it's actually going to be a lot of fun to build apps because you don't need to focus on all the boring parts, which is getting data. What does all this mean? Well, there's a famous quote by Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to invent them. And this quote kind of assumes that, you know, if you want to see the future happen, let's invent cool stuff, and, and, and then this is where the future is going to go. We like this quote, but actually there's a slight alteration of this quote that we like a bit better with a solid team, which is the best way to invent the future is to predict it. Mm. So this means that if you want the future, let's predict what we want. And the world that we predict is a world in which people are free again to make their own choices, that you don't have to choose one app and stick with it for the rest of your life. That's the kind of future we predict, a future which is choice and people can do what they want again. We're predicting a future where the web is again for everyone, not just for the Facebookers or the Twitterers or anything else. So the question is not like, let's invent and let's see what the future will look like. The question is, what do we want the future to look like? And let's invent those things that are necessary to make it happen. And this is why Solid is calling upon like all of us to you know, try it out, get your hands dirty, and uh, make cool things. And let the web flourish again, thanks to permission and innovation. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, so as Ruben alluded to, we all know that uh, Tim obviously created the web 30 years ago. Uh, but Tim recently uh, left, took a sabbatical in fact from MIT to create his first startup, which is Inrupt. And the fundamental pur uh, purpose of Inrupt is to commercialize the ideas behind Solid, that ecosystem that Ruben alluded to. Um, so Solid actually began about uh, three and a half years ago as an idea from Tim to try and write what he saw as the wrongs in the web. Okay, that Ruben did a great job of explaining, I think. Um, so that actual project Solid within MIT uh, was actually begun with uh, a large donation from MasterCard, in fact, a $1 million donation from the Global Chief Innovation Officer of MasterCard, Gary Lyons. And I'll loop back to Gary again uh, when I talk about my personal experiences with linked data and my experiences with using linked data in um, enterprises, because I want to share that as well. Um, but uh, over those three and a half years, Tim spent that million dollars and built what we have today in terms of solid. Um, but he felt that the time was right to take a sabbatical from MIT and to begin to commercialize the, the ideas behind solid because he thought that the solid um, system he had built had proven its point and was now ready for, for, for global commercialization, right, and for mass adoption. And so that fundamentally is, is, is the, the reason for Inrupt, to commercialize the concept, the ecosystem behind solid, okay? Um, and really, if you take one takeaway from this particular short presentation, uh, the, the relationship between Inrupt and Solid can be kind of explained very succinctly as um, Inrupt wants to be to Solid what effectively Red Hat is today to Linux. Okay? So, you know, Red Hat is a commercial operation. It tries to support the community of the open source community around Linux, but it's also supporting enterprises, right? It's, it's a commercial operating model, generates money, profits. That, that pays its for developers to contribute to the Linux. Um, you know, uh, the Linux uh, effort, let's say. Um, so Inrupt's relationship to Solid is similar to that. And if you want to get a really succinct, overly, overly simplistic uh, definition, maybe that's it. So, um, yeah, basically it all boils down to Solid is uh, Tim's attempt to write very solid work. The web is beginning to diverge from his original principles. Okay, so as Ruben alluded to, I think most people are familiar with the idea that you know, the, the, what, what Solid is really all about is about giving individuals their own personal pods. And that, that, that really inverts the whole architecture of the web fundamentally, right? Uh, and it really uh, alleviates a lot of problems for the major constituents of the web, which are users, uh, corporations, and developers. That, that's how we see it in Enrupt. They're the major constituents of the web today. And by simply adopting this model, where the, the individual is can control and manages their personal data within their space, um, you know, it, it, it frees that, that user to be able to, as Ruben alluded to, to choose the apps they want to access and use to, to access their data. Um, it allows those, those, those application developers to build applications that can now, with the user's consent, get access to all of that user's data without having to entice the user to give that app their data. Right? The, the user can instead consent to give that app potentially all access to all of its data. And that's very, very powerful for developers. Because really what developers want to build is just exciting applications. Okay? They don't have to go through the hassle of enticing users to give them bits of their information. And from a corporation's perspective, um, this frees them from all the, the, the burdens of collecting data, storing data, securing data, managing data. For, for, because for the vast majority of organizations, that really does not help the core business. Okay? And we're seeing that more and more and more with GDPR and enforcing compliance restrictions on companies. Um, and it's just been amazing in, 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 in Rupt that a lot of the incoming, the inbound kind of um, uh, corporations that are coming to Enrupt are specifically because they want to get away from hoarding individuals' data. It's been really insightful actually just to see that in the last few months. Okay, so that's the model. But fundamentally in Enrupt, and across the, the solid uh, community I think, and Ruben alluded to this as well, we, we fundamentally believe it's, it's essential that we, 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 we nourish an ecosystem for this solid vision to really uh, succeed on a global scale, okay? It's basically exactly the same as the original web that uh, Tim created 30 years ago. The reason it succeeded so, so spectacularly is because all the stakeholders found value by being on the web. Users, um, you know, uh, developers, uh, large corporations, small corporations, governments, every stakeholder found value by being on the web, okay? So we recognize that we need to support an ecosystem on top of solid to achieve the same end Right? Global adoption, fundamentally. Okay? And that's where Enrupt comes in, fundamentally. So here on the left, we have basically what Solid is. 
you know, in simplistic terms. So solid, as again, as Ruben alluded to, is basically the technology. Okay? And the technology can be expressed around solid in terms of the standards, the specifications. That's where a lot of the, the, the three and a half years that Tim spent in MIT <coughs> working on solid was actually focusing on developing W3C and related standards okay? to support his vision of solid to enable individuals to have control and agency over their data anywhere on the web. Okay? So really, if you want to think about solid, you can think of it as, from a technology point of view, as just a suite of W3C standards. And anybody is free to implement those standards, you know, in, in you know, standard web mentality. Everything is open, W3C standards. So anybody can implement that suite of specifications, mostly W3C, and if they do that, they will have a compliant solid server. And we want uh, other corporations to begin to do that. Okay? Um, and then, as Ruben alluded to as well, that solid is also a community. It's been a community from the start. It's a very active community. It's rapidly growing now <coughs> in terms of numbers. Um, so we see that all the time, especially now with Tim having taken a sabbatical from, sabbatical from MIT. He's, he's engaging in a kind of a world tour of promotion around the concept. He's doing a lot of media uh, engagements. And so we're seeing a lot more activity in that community that's growing quite rapidly. And also, as Ruben alluded, alluded to, Solid is really a part, I would say, of a, of a broader movement as well. Okay? Because that movement um, is not just Solid, although we personally see Solid as front and center in that movement, but it, there's other communities and participants in the movement towards re-decentralization. Okay? So those movements are, we're going to see Made Safe later today as an example, IPFS, the Interplanetary File System is another uh, community as part of that movement. Uh, we've got the DAT, DAT uh, movement as well. We've got the DIDs, the Decentralized Identifiers. We've got the Self-Sovereign Identity community as well. All of these, I see, are all contributing towards this movement towards re-decentralization. And, and that single word, single word is, is also another expression of Tim's vision for where he sees the web, you know, returning to that original vision of a completely decentralized web, okay? Um, and of course, it's diverged towards a more and more centralized web that I think most people are familiar with today. So, so that's solid, right? And, and, and Rot is a commercial entity that wants to nourish and support that ecosystem, all those components of the solid ecosystem. If you like. So we're a commercial company, we want to spark and, and, and nurture and engage with those communities and those movements. We also, of course, as a, corp as a corp corporation, um, we want to help evolve those standards that make up the technology. So those standards, the W3C standards today, but they're obviously going to evolve over time. We totally recognize that. And Rupt is totally committed to contributing to that evolution. Um, but we're also a commercial hub as well. Same way again, if you like to read that to Linux. But we, we fundamentally recognize that corporations are a fundamentally important uh, constituent on the web. Okay? And we, we need to support them as well in their view of how Solid needs to operate, which means commercial grade integration to existing systems, like LDAP or Active Directory, let's say, <coughs> integration with existing messaging systems that are enterprise grade, let's say, like MQ series, perhaps. <clears throat> and all these aspects we see, we see as being contributed from Inrupt, perhaps, to support the, the, the corporations and the, the, the commercial enterprises. So Inrupt is effectively trying to support all aspects of that ecosystem that, said, that we per per uh, perceive as being essential for the success of Solid. OK. So Inrupt, basically, um, <clears throat> from looking at that organization, constituent on the web. In Rupp wants to make solid technology that is scalable, secure, and integrates with existing enterprise environments. It's kind of that simple. Okay? Uh, simplify a bit, I guess. But if you want to surmise what in Rupp's vision is for supporting organizations, this is it. Um, uh, yeah, so in Rupp, we're, I'm actively on an enterprise architect, so that's one of my focuses in the immediate future. Um, now, what I want to talk about here very quickly uh, we can get dragged into major discussions in each one of these examples, but I just want to talk you through uh, my personal experience with using linked data, and then in the final example, using linked data and solid on top of it within large, major corporations, global brand name corporations. Okay, because I want to get across the fact that a lot of this technology might seem new to a lot of people, but um, I've been doing this kind of thing for years in enterprises and solved real enterprise problems for major corporations using the foundational technology that we're talking about here, which is fundamentally linked data. That's the basis for everything we're doing here. Ruben, I think, did a great job of that. So I'll try and keep this short and succinct, which I struggle with sometimes. Um, so the first example of my, my linked data journey, let's say, in enterprises began about eight or nine years ago when I was a <coughs> technical architect in Dun & Bradstreet, DMB. So I don't know how many people are familiar with DMB, but um, it's a major American corporation. 
But anyway, I was an architect in there, and DMB wanted to move into a new space, which was compliance. We're off market for, for, for DMB, they perceived. So I was the uh, technical architect for this brand new product for compliance. Now, because I was you know, using all the best practices and using all the latest technologies, my system that I built was all kind of whiz-bang and super performance. We had the front ends were super responsive. Everything was great. Except one of the core features of our compliance product was that we wanted to um, provide the user with a report, an existing report from DMB, a compliance report. And this report happened to be quite graph-like in nature. In fact, it was a, a simplistic graph, it was a tree. And this tree is very, very simple. It simply represented the corporate ownership structure of any company. And the corporate ownership structure of a company globally is very simply a tree, which means the global headquarters is the single root of the tree, and then the direct subsidiaries of that global ultimate form the, the initial branches, and then each subsidiary can have subsidiaries, and each subsidiary can have subsidiaries. And that, that can grow to, to many thousands, in fact, for large corporations. Okay? Anyway, that was the report that our compliance product wanted to produce. I built this brand new SNASI application to deliver this report, but when our system made a back-end request for that report, Okay, if that report had nearly 1,500 companies in its tree structure, our system would actually sit there with a spinner for on average 18 seconds. Right? Now, I'm a technical architect, pride myself on building modern you know, performance systems, and I had to sit in demonstrations with clients, and I was really worried, oh my god, if they ask us to demo and pull back a report for a company with about 1,500 nodes, everybody in the room is going to be sitting looking at a spinner for 18 seconds. Okay? And so, as a technical architect, um, I, I kind of very quickly realized, well, hold on a second. This, this report that we're pulling back and rendering to the user that can take up to 18 seconds to retrieve is very, very graph-like in nature. It's actually a tree. It always will be a tree. And I thought, well, hold on a second. How about, and I could understand why this, this query was taking 18 seconds. It's because if you think of a relational database table, you've got to do 1,500 inner you know, self-joins on that table to create a tree. You're talking about 15, 18 seconds. Even with a major cluster of production machines, <clears throat> running Oracle, costing a fortune, right? So, as an engineer, I said, well, let me just try this uh, by taking the data that fed that graph, to fed that, 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 that compliance report, turned it into RDF, and threw it in a triple store. Okay, that's all I did. The hard part was actually getting the data, of course. Always an enterprise is really hard. Um, but once I got the data, it was actually really enlighteningly simple to turn it into RDF, throw it in a triple store, write a very elegant, simple, sparkle query, to query that database and pull back the corporate tree, the simple tree. And my floor, my, my jaw dropped on the floor as soon as I ran this first query. Right? I didn't do any optimization, I didn't tweak the query, I didn't tweak, tweak the database, and I got the same response in 0.8 of a second. Okay? And this was on my laptop. Okay? So this was a 0.8 of a second response compared to an 18 second response from the production cluster of Oracle machines that were being costing a fortune. Okay? So this was a really big kind of light bulb moment for me in the application of graph data, particularly linked data. But I didn't stop there. The next, very next thing I did was I said, well, actually, I've also heard that this linked data representation of data, of, of a graph, is also really, really powerful for integrating disparate data sets. Okay, so I said, well, that, that first exercise was really easy. I said, well, what I'll do is I'll try it again with a totally different data set, but with, still within DMB. Okay, and I took that first data set, turned it into RDF, threw it on top of the existing triple, and then within like about half an hour, I could simply query the existing report exactly as it was before, 20 times faster than production systems, right? plus I could demonstrate integration with a totally different data set within DMB. Nobody had ever done this in DMB. Um, and then I went further and I took a second and a third database or data set, turned it into RDF, threw it into the same triple store, and now I could generate the exact same report as production, but now show integration with totally different data sets within DMB. So this was really, really groundbreaking. I'm oh, sorry, oh my God. It's okay. I'm gonna go way over. <laughs> I knew we could try that. Um, anyway, um, so this was groundbreaking in DMV. I built a really cool demo of this. This is it's not a DMV snapshot, by the way, because that DMV data was never publish, published, um, so we can't actually share that. But this is a similar example of the visualization I built from open corporates. Anybody can go to that link and play with it. Um, but, but my visual, I actually learned JavaScript just so I could learn D3, just so I could render this, these graphs in uh, an interactive force directed graph, right? Because I knew that would get the attention of the executives. And um, so that was hugely successful. And then what actually happened was, um, <coughs> you remember that guy, Gary Lyons? Gary Lyons was actually in my class in college in Dublin when I was in university. And I've kept in touch with Gary over the years. And Gary, remember, was the global chief innovation officer for MasterCard. Okay? And Gary was the guy who gave Tim Berners-Lee $1 million as a donation to try and just see what he could do with this solid idea. Okay? 
And when I met Gary for lunch one day, uh, Gary said, look, what are you up to? And I told him what I built in d and using linked data. You know, Gary's eyes just lit up. He went, holy shit. He put two and two together. He went, holy shit, I've just invested a million dollars in what Tim Berners Lee is doing for using linked data. You've just done this kind of incredible demonstration of the power of linked data within an enterprise. And he said, right, I want you to come to MasterCard. And literally, six weeks later, I was <coughs> working in MasterCard in Dublin. So, the next progression was within MasterCard, trying to apply the same ideas of linked data, graph representations, what can we do? And what actually happened was, um, DMB, or sorry, MasterCard acquired a company called Vocalink, okay, for $600 million, a major, major investment. And um, what Vocalink do, they're actually an English company, and they have a very, very, very um, unique data set, okay, that I'm pretty much sure is unique in the world, really, is that Vocalink, because they're a clearinghouse, they get to see every single bank transaction in the entire UK, okay, across all the banking networks, okay, they get one overarching view of everything, right? Now, Vocalink knew this was an incredibly powerful data set, right? And they thought, well, actually, we've heard that, you know, if you model data as a graph, you can do really cool things with, like, um, fraud detection, right? But Vocalink had no graph modelers, and they had no graph visualization, people that could do the graph visualization. But when MasterCard acquired them, they heard about me and what I built a DB. And Vocalink came very quickly to me and they said, look, we really, had, we really think we have a very valuable data set here. We think it could be really useful to get fraud data out of it, sophisticated fraud data out of it. But we don't know how to model it as a graph, we don't know how to visualize it. <coughs> so what I did was exactly the same as I did at DMB. I took that vocal link data, turned it into RDF, threw it in the triple store, you know, queried it, and then graphed it using D3 again. And this is actually a, 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 a screenshot from the real present uh, visualization that I built for vocal link. Um, and what, what the vocal link guys thought originally was, well, once we get a bit of graph, then we can start querying it and we can run our algorithms on it. And, you know, graph algorithms and machine learning and AI stuff to, to detect the, the, the sophisticated um, fraud networks that we suspect are in there. But actually, that wasn't required. They didn't do, need to do that at all. As soon as we simply visualize it as a force directed graph, and that's literally what this is, immediately certain motifs began to just appear in the data. Okay? Motifs of these design and patterns. And look, hold on, that looks kind of suspicious. What, what kind of an activity is this? Right? And actually, they come up with terms like dandelion to represent this kind of a shape. These are all fraudulent transactions that, that hopefully you can see across the entire banking network. And this motif of a dandelion is quite good. <coughs> but this one, these two here, you know, kind of suspect one here, uh, they called hemlocks. These are actually sophisticated uh, fraud networks. So criminal organizations that deliberately transfer money from one bank to another bank to a third bank and then extract it out of the system, take it out of like, its cash and leave it um, and, and the individual banks could never see these networks, because all they ever saw were their individual silos. Right? As soon as we rendered it as a graph, just use force-directed graph to, be, to draw it on a picture immediately if you wanted to identify very suspect activity in the network. Okay? This was like huge for both of it. Right? Um, <clears throat> they actually started using this visualization in presentations all over the world. Right? And actually created a whole new branch of products for Volcanic. A right? huge new revenue stream for Volcanic. Um, and it was huge kudos from this, actually. But anyway, that. Lastly, um, what happened then in MasterCard, the MasterCard mainstream, if you like. <coughs> now I have built you know, these multiple you know, linked data concepts and graphs, and visualizations. And literally that same guy, Gary Lyons, came up to me about two years after he'd given the money to Tim. He, he never told me, by the way, that he'd given Tim that million dollars, even though it's in the public domain. Um, and Gary came up to me and says, hey, Pat, um, can you have a look and see what Tim's been doing for the last two years with that million dollars I gave him? Right? He literally had no idea what Tim had done. And I went, what, you gave Tim a million dollars two years ago? And he went, yeah, 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 see what he's doing, will you? And I, <laughs> so when I had a look at Saul initially, again, just kind of another huge light bulb moment, I went, oh my god. Right? I was a linked data guy, I had suggested multiple ideas around digital identity and how MasterCard could, could, could um, address digital identity because of its global position, its power, its reach. And I was a real believer in linked data from my experience. Um, and then I saw what Tim had done at all, and I went, whoa, this is so far ahead of anything I thought about in terms of linked data and applying it to digital identity, okay? So then I realized, holy shit, uh, but I, I reviewed the code as well, and the code was kind of from an enterprise perspective, was not really up to scratch, etc. But I said, this architecture and this approach is absolutely spot on. I totally agree with the way this, this idea of centralized pods for the individual, but never the center of the, of the, of the web, really, was absolutely going to go. So, and then another coincidence, about two months after I reviewed the solid system, an opportunity came in, or came in from, to MasterCard to apply solid pods in production, in MasterCard, to address a real issue for actual customers. Okay? 
what actually happened was, so MasterCard does an awful lot of work in um, financial inclusion. They work a lot with NGOs. <coughs> and what happened was, six of the biggest NGOs on the planet, as a consortium, came to MasterCard and said, hey, MasterCard, can you help us address a really core problem that we all share as NGOs? And not just us, but also our donors, the, the corporations or the governments that give money to the, to the NGOs. <coughs> and we said, well, what, what was the problem? The problem was really simple. It was that collectively the, NGO, the NGOs realized that they were losing tens of millions of man hours every year, right, just being wasted, because they were registering and re-registering and re-registering the same individuals, let's say a refugee, in each NGO's proprietary registration system. Okay? Typical enterprise approaches, each NGO is a separate kind of enterprise. They were registering the same individual though in each of their silos. Um, and they realized that that was a huge problem because it was wasting man effort. It was a real pain for the refugee because to do a registration for an NGO takes on average about 90 minutes. And they had to do it over and over and over again for every NGO they interacted with. Um, and also, the donors had a real problem because they couldn't do reliable reporting. Okay? The, the donors were, would ask the NGOs, how many people did you guys help in the last year with the money we gave you? And, and they could all answer individually, but there was no way to de-dupe individuals. Because right? they all had different identifiers for individuals within their databases. Okay? So these would be problems. Now, when they came initially, I mean, and I was in a workshop that was to address this issue for the NGOs, I, I knew that everybody in the room had already solved this problem in their head. Because right? it's a simple so problem to solve, really. And really what I think they were asking for was, hey, MasterCard, can you please create a, just a centralized database for us? Right? And each of us as NGOs right, will simply you know, read and write from that centralized MasterCard database of refugees. Right? And you will manage this deduping for us on this re-registration problem. <clears throat> but I was in that meeting, and I thought, this is the perfect opportunity to start changing the whole conversation for the NGOs around how they deal with individual refugees' data, personal data. Okay? And I dropped in the idea that, well, hold on a second. If we just invert this whole idea right, of a centralized database hosted by MasterCard for refugees, and instead, as soon as a refugee arrives at the first NGO, that NGO will provision a pod for that refugee. And that's the refugee's pod. Okay? And then when the, 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 the go through the normal registration process, it takes 90 minutes, but the pod now is populated with that refugee's registration data. Okay? That refugee leaves that NGO with an identifier now that's theirs. Okay? Just a web ID, just for you or I. And they go to the next NGO, okay? and they say, hey, I have this web ID, and it's a pod, and I can consent to give you access to that pod. And that NGO simply dereferences that URI and uses solid, and now has full access to that refugee's registration data, regardless of what other NGO <coughs> you know, collected it in the first place. Right? The NGOs totally got this concept very, very quickly. MasterCard got it as well, but a little bit more slowly. Right? Um, but this really began to change things within MasterCard, within a major division of MasterCard, which was the humanitarian division. So this started off as one pilot project that I built, which was the Architect 4 of MasterCard. Um, we engaged with two of those six uh, NGOs. And we actually did a live pilot last December, right? but just with the friends and families of those two NGOs, not in the field yet. Um, and it was a huge success. And this architecture diagram which is very busy, actually. But it's not a MasterCard architecture. This is actually an architecture that was produced after that pilot by one of the NGOs. Right? And this was just brilliant from my perspective. This was clearly the NGOs really getting the concept of pods and putting individuals, in their case refugees, at the center of their solution <coughs> and granting those refugees pods which could be hosted by anybody, anywhere, including competitors. So we're here and they says, well, we want competitors. We don't want to host people's data. We don't want to monetize it. It's not our data. This is refugees' data. We want them to choose where they store that <coughs> personal data. So the reason why I go through that litany of experience in enterprises is because I want to get across the point that the underlying technology here is not new or nascent or unproven or experimental. Right? I've been using this technology, linked data, for years. Over eight years now, it started off at DMB to solve real problems for enterprises. Okay? And initially, I didn't really care at all about the semantic web, the grand vision of you know, a global single database or anything. I was an enterprise developer. I was solving problems for enterprises. And I saw the potential of linked data to merge multiple data sets as, as really solving problems within a single enterprise. That was all I cared about. That was all I could control anyway. But I was solving real problems for each of those enterprises just by using linked data internally. <clears throat> and in the third case, so once you would push that out to solid, um, then you, bring to, you begin to bring in the whole world, which is kind of what Ruben was alluding to as well. So I just wanted to share that, that kind of experience that I've had. <coughs> and that's why, obviously, I was very excited to join the road.
to continue that vision and actually pursue engagement with MasterCard. So actually this, um, this presentation, this, this concept was actually a joint submission from MasterCard and Enrot at um, the World Bank's inaugural big competition they had called ID for Development, ID for D. Um, but I won't want to talk about that too much because uh, even though there were 176 entries, 54 countries, we came second. <coughs> we came second. Excuse me. So that kind of pissed us off a bit. <laughs> <laughs> the reasons for that are complicated. Anyway, um, but that, that project is absolutely continuing. Those NGOs, and I want to bring that to the next level, which is deployed in the field. <coughs> so, okay, to simplify that all back there again, so from an organization's perspective, um, Enrupt now already has multiple use cases underway in industries like healthcare, telecommunications, and finance, and there are others. Um, but because of the degree of incoming we have from these corporations, we've actually deliberately chosen only corporations in these sectors, in these industries, that are talking in the tens of millions of users. That's the level of interest that Enrupt is getting already. Only, and Tim only, they only, Enrupt only came out of kind of stealth mode last September. Okay? We're already getting a huge inbound from major, major organizations. Okay? So I'm you know, trying to get the point across that you know, this is really a groundswell of awareness, I think, growing around these concepts. Okay. So, again, I want to take this back to the importance of that ecosystem, though. We're absolutely not just focusing on corporations, right? This will only succeed if, if the whole ecosystem kind of adopts this and uh, you know, that we nurture the, the other constituents of the web, right, the users and developers. And fundamental to that, again, Ruben made this point, I totally agree, the developer experience is fundamental. I have many, many, many years now of using linked data in enterprises and fundamentally come up time and time again against developers' resistance and inertia. To the con to, it was a very simple shift. It's a simple shift, but it's a complicated one that has a lot of inertia. That shift is from what developers are familiar with today, which is POJOs, right, simple objects. Okay? And the shift they have to make, I'm afraid, is to graphs. Okay? So it's a simple thing to explain, but it's actually a complicated, hard thing for developers who have just natural inertia to new concepts really, that, are, that are very different. So we fundamentally recognize that developer experience is crucial to this, this whole effort around solid. Okay? So what are we doing in the run? So we're already producing um, SDKs. We have a developer SDK already today, and it goes through uh, big bi-weekly releases, so it's very active, being supported by Unruck. Uh, and that basically is uh, <coughs> like Yeoman, people know Yeoman JavaScript, or it's like Maven Archetypes. It's basically you run this and it'll generate a boilerplate app for you, a boilerplate solid app, okay, to help developers get kick-started. Okay? Um, so anybody can use that, it's called the Developer SDK, check it out and interrupt. Uh, uh, obviously we are, we're also providing free pod hosting for anybody for testing, so anybody here can simply create a new pod, go to interrupt.net, register a new pod, uh, so interrupt is supporting that. We're also improving the server implementation. So I alluded to that earlier when I was in MasterCard and we viewed the solid code base, I was like, ooh, okay, that's not what I consider production ready, right? As, a, as an enterprise developer. So Enrupt is putting a major resources now into improving that code base and rewriting it. Uh, we're also extending the test suite. Again, as an enterprise guy, that's fundamental on the test set. So we're spending a lot of time doing that. And then lastly, we're also building tooling as well. So Ruben gave a great example there of one of those tools, which is LD Flex, and we've another one in the pipeline that I've been using for years. Um, so that's what we're doing for developers, quite comprehensive. All of that coming from the roof. So, finally, how can you guys, how can everybody get involved? There's lots of things you can do. The first one, the most obvious one, get a pod yourselves. Just go to inroof.net, register, you've got a pod. Then you can begin to play with it, you know, have chats with friends who also have pods, etc. Et you can also contribute directly to the standards. Everything is open technology. That's really the solid <coughs> part, not in Rupt. Uh, Rupt doesn't control the standards or anything. Um, so you're, any, anybody in the world is welcome to contribute to those standards. Um, you can also join the chat groups, we've moved all of them, but this is the most kind of easy one to enter into, solid flash chat, Tim's in there very often, say hello to Tim. Um, you can post to the forum for, for more thre threaded discussions, where you can ask questions and follow the thread into responses. Uh, we also are supporting hosting these events, for Paul is, is an example, I was talking to Ruben earlier, I don't know how many of these we've done already, it's in Rupt. I think it might be up to 20. Already? All over the world, cities all over the world, these meetups and startups. Um, so and that's just accelerating as well. And obviously, how can you get involved just if you're a developer? Start building an app. Right? Use the developer SDK, get your kickstarted, connect that to your pod, start interacting with your pod using LD Flex as a developer tool, as an example. To Red Hat to Linux. It's kind of that simple. That's it. <laughs> Thank you.
conscious of time, I can see perhaps the enthusiasm there. And actually, some of the things you were talking about with the corporate deployments and the shapes, I couldn't believe the similarity with what you know I've been doing in the past. So we were going to have questions, but I'm conscious. I'd like to have the questions at the end. Do you want to do yours, Nikita? So. Uh, I'm Nikita from MadeSafe, and MadeSafe is a company that develops the Safe Network. And I'm just going to give a quick run through what the Safe, not, the safe Network actually is, because uh, many of you might be not familiar with the uh, project that we are working on. So basically, Safe is an acronym for uh, secure access for everyone. And uh, it is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network, which um, I wouldn't say that it would be an overstatement, but it builds on one major premise. Uh, that is like uh, giving the people control over their data. Um, and in many ways, it's also similar to the idea of pods, because the data is not stored like on a single server, because usually we think that like there is this um, just as Ruben explained, like there is in our in, in minds of developers, there is usually this relation that we use apps, and those apps are like for uh, social networks or for some products which store our data. But it doesn't have to be that way because we can inverse the relationship between apps and data. And Safe Network is exactly that. So it stores the data. Um, across the distributed uh, network of users' devices, which we call wallets. And those devices can be like just your personal computers or IoT devices or even your mobile phones, like uh, basically anything. Uh, and you can think about the safe network essentially as a block device. So, so basically just a hard, um, hard drive disk or basically just as some abstract storage or an abstract cloud where you can put your data in. Because this is a very important idea that the safe network is not, is not concerned about what kind of data you store there. The basic idea is that you should be able to store data and have a control over it. So you have control over to, to who can read this data, including like other people and uh, any kind of apps. So you can store your photos, your videos, or websites on the network, and you control which apps can get access to that data. And because it's like the because it's the, the, the safe network is a, a very abstract thing, we can support multiple use cases for that, including like applications like desktop applications, which can store data there, or we can support like. Uh, the web applications or websites. And um, a very important property of the safe network is that uh, the data uh, stored in perpetuity. So basically, once you put your data on the network and once it's been publicized, so if you put your website on the, on the network, you can't really delete it anymore. And all the data that you will, uh, so for example, if you want to update your blog, uh, it won't override the existing data. Oh, well, sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, so, I just, uh, sorry. Uh, right, be fine. Okay. <laughs> sorry about so, that. Really, it won't override your existing like data. Um, it will just like put the, the, it, it will just update your blog, but you can always return back in time to see your previous blog posts and the previous states of your websites. So kind of like Internet Archive, but on the level of the whole network and the, on the level of the whole data stored on the network. And uh, another important property of that is that uh, because it's called secure access for everyone, all data is guaranteed to be accessible at any time without any charge. So once you put your data on the network, you can always download it free of charge. And uh, the, the economy of the network is, insensible, is incentivized by a kind of cryptocurrency that is called SafeCoin. And uh, it um, it's probably wouldn't be uh, correct to compare it with Bitcoin, but you can also think about it as a kind of a uh, cryptocurrency that would pay to store the data on the network. And this cryptocurrency's 
uh, basically it is paid to people who host your data. Uh, and the, the, the important thing about this data is that it is encrypted, but I will talk about that a little bit later. Well, there is another important property of the network is that it is autonomous, so it's not controlled by anyone. It's not controlled by a single um, central server or a single authority that can uh, tell you which data you can put or uh, if you can join the network or not. So basically, it's comprised of uh, uh, of multiple computers which agree um, who can join the network and. Uh, who can put the data, so basically it's controlled by a group consensus of, uh, of multiple computers, but not a single uh, central server that dictates, like, basically its authority to all the network users. Oops. So I'll sample that, sorry. I think it's because of... Full screen. Full screen. It's already on full screen. Yeah. Oh, oops. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so, what kinds of data you can store in the network? So, as I explained, it can be any kind of data, any sort of data, like uh, files, so like video files, blog posts, whatever, like comments, likes, it's all data. Um, but fundamentally, on the fundamental network level, there are two types of data. Like, you can generalize it as immutable data, so this is the data type that um, once you put it on the network, it can be deleted, it can be mutated, it can be changed. And it gives us certain important properties, like, uh, for example, this data can be cached, and because we know it can be changed, um, it allows us to build effective, like, effective content distribution, um, and it allows us to store the data close to users who request it. And it also has an important property of the duplication. So, once we know that we want to store some kind of a data on the network, um, the location of that data where the, net, where the network stores this data is determined by the by hash of this data. So for, for certain files, this location will always be unique, and we can deterministically know at which location this file is going to be stored. And uh, this means that if, we, if users want to store um, a same song, for example, on the network, this data will be stored at exactly the same location and it doesn't have to be stored like multiple times because if you think about it, the amount of duplicated data stored on the internet is just huge, it's dispro disproportionate and uh, instead of that we can have like how we can store this data only once and it doesn't, we don't have to duplicate it. Um, another important property of the mutable data is that it's split into chunks. So, even if your data is not encrypted, it can't be accessed by computers that store it, uh, because computers will not store uh, like your song in its entirety. So, or if you store your photos on on the network, you, uh, no one can access your photos because it can be stored as a single file. But it's planned, it, instead, it's going to be split into multiple chunks, and those small chunks will be stored at different locations. So. Uh, to get that photo back to your machine, like a, as a client, uh, you need to basically know all of the locations of those chunks or small uh, small parts of this data, and you need to request all of the parts to combine them back into the original file. And this gives us uh, basically privacy. And on top of that, if you encrypt your file, um, no one, in addition to having to know the locations of these data chunks on the network, you will, have, you will also have to know uh, your encryption keys. So it basically gives, it gives us the uh, peace of mind when we store uh, data on the computers of the network users. Is it not moving forward, Nikita? Oh? Is it moving forward? Yeah. Oh. Uh, so the Sorry. next kind of uh, data is dependable data, and uh, it's called dependable data because you can't uh, override the data on the network. It stores forever, basically, and it gives us a very important property that allows you to browse the net. Uh, for example, that allows you to browse the websites on the network, um, 
and ability to see how this exact website looked back 10 years ago, for example, because we lost so many data, so much data um, from the internet, and we uh, can access the websites that were there like 20 years ago only because uh, inter the Internet Archive um, decided that it is a worthy, uh, it is worth to store all the data, that, all the websites that we publish in a in a single service that we can always access and see how this page looked back in time. And this is actually a very important, a very important problem because so much data is lost and so much user-generated data is lost. So much, uh, so many user guides, so many references, so many content created by users, so many photos, so many, uh, well, you name it. It's like, uh, I guess any, everyone in this, <laughs> Everyone here can remember like at least one case of when, when data was lost. So like the image postings, there, there, there are many cases of that. And this is especially important for um, uh, basically building the solid and the safe network because um, first of all, uh, the, the both of the projects pursue this, uh, essentially the same goals. So giving the choice to the users and also giving the privacy back in control for, for the users. And uh, essentially the safe network, because it's agnostic to the data that you store there, uh, can serve as the decentralized uh, pods and the data that is stored, like the solid data that is stored on the safe network will, can be also encrypted by default. And another important aspect of storing like the uh, the solid and like linked data on the safe network is exactly because of the problem of uh, link rot. So essentially, currently if we rely on on web servers. Uh, we have the same exact problem again uh, because once uh, certain servers are shuts down and. Um, if certain piece of data links to uh, links to other piece of data located on that server, uh, basically it's lost forever because uh, we can't request that data because that server is already doesn't already doesn't exist. Um, so with that, with that it will be really uh, it will be a really hard problem to build the semantic web because we can't rely on HTTP servers. So we have to, um, basically we have to be sure that the data that we store on the network, on the internet, is stored on a reliable server. And it is a very hard problem um, to, it is a very hard problem to solve to make a server reliable because we have to build the infrastructure for it because we have to <coughs> provide uh, resources for it and essentially, it brings us back to the same problem of uh, centralizing data in a one, uh, with one data center or with one uh, data storage provider. And also, the uh, safe network also, around, um, if we bridge the solid and the safe network, um, it also allows to query uh, data that is stored on, uh, for example, it would be possible to query data um, from multiple data sources. So it means that if our data is stored on multiple user computers, it is uh, scattered across the network. Uh, basically how Ruben explained, we can use a Sparkle or LDflex or any query language to bring all of the pieces of data together and display a single web page that would look like your familiar uh, social networking application like Facebook or Twitter or whatever like and the control over this data is in the user's hands because only users decide which kind of data they want to uh, they want to provide and which they would prefer to keep private and applications would have to request access to this data and of course like uh, a very nice aspect of um, allowing to run solid apps on the safe network is that developers wouldn't have to learn the new unfamiliar APIs because on the safe network we have our own sets of APIs and uh, it can be um, 
from the point of view of developers' experience, it can, it can be a little bit intimidating to learn all, all of these new concepts and all of this new stuff because um, it's unfamiliar. And if um, if a developer already has an experience now with uh, Solid, they can just run their apps on this on this safe network without having to learn all of this new stuff because it's, uh, our goal is to make it work seamlessly so that you can run uh, the existing solid applications on, the, on top of the safe network uh, using the encrypted data storage that is like distributed across the network users. Uh, so what do we already have uh, with the, uh, what is the current situation with the uh, solid, and, with, with solid and the safe network? Well, currently we have the Alpha 2 running, so it's like the second iteration of the test network that allows uh, people to build their applications on top of the safe uh, network APIs. And we also already have experimental support for RDF and like all of the uh, connected technologies like Sparkle and uh, others. So you can store like, trip, so you can use the safe network essentially as a triple store. <coughs> and we already have uh, some community members uh, some of our community members already developed like, uh, bridges for Solid to experimentally run uh, Solid applications on top of the safe network. So all of that is already available and you can use, um, you can register on the safe network and try to uh, use some of our apps and also try to run sol some of the Solid apps developed by our community <coughs> members. And for we also uh, making it supported like on the more fundamental level to make it a part of the safe network because we feel that it is very important to um, to make the uh, these technologies and these uh, these projects interoperable. So basically, we don't want to invent our own kinds of uh, data types. We don't want to invent our own ways to represent some kind of uh, data like files or uh, domain names or whatever. We want to use the existing standards, and those standards are actually, the, the good thing about that is that those standards are already defined by WCC, which is a reputable organization, and many, many networks already support this data, like for example, Solid, which relies on Sparkle and RDF, which are uh, WCC standards. So we don't want to invent our own, so currently we want to make it a part of the uh, safe network fundamental stack of technologies. Uh, so basically it will allow you to, to, to if you're more familiar with uh, RDF or Sparkle or Aldiflex or you know, this, this stack of technology, you can develop your apps uh, for the safe network using these technologies and not learning completely new ideas and concepts. Uh, and you can learn more about like the safe network itself because it was a very quick run through and it is it is much more nuanced and there are many more aspects to it. So you can learn more about that on the safe network website, which is safe network tech, and uh, you can also join our community forums to um, to basically try to uh, use the safe network for itself and uh, to learn more about the, the ideas. And that's it. So, if you have any questions, Nikita Baksalia. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Um, what I'm going to suggest then, uh, we're just open to questions now. So we have Pat and if we get Ruben, Ruben Pat, and to yourself, you can take the chair there. Do you want to pull your chair out of here or, or sit just sit on the ledge or something and then we're open for uh, questions? And just one more extra thing is that uh, there's also here, uh, there's also one of the safe network developers, so I would like if you have more Shall, we put, shall we put him on the spot and get him to answer now? Okay. Should you kind of answer Yeah, all right. So, so when you ask a question, if you can do the normal thing, just let us know what your name is and maybe where you're working, um, and then answer a question. So who, who wants to go first? Oh, Graham Klein, oh, could you stand in the middle? Lastly, working at Oxford University. Question for Pat and maybe Paul. Um, when you talk about deploying solid pod services in an enterprise environment, what software are you using for that? 
So, for example, Mastercard was using. Sorry, if, I, if you don't mind me, um, could you repeat the question because I, the oh. might might have, might not have picked the question up. Okay. So for solid deployments, what? For enterprise strength solid deployments. Oh. What, what software are you using? Oh, there isn't any yet. Huh? Okay. So for that Mastercard deployment, right? We were using the community edition of Node Solid Server. Okay. Yeah? yeah, but because that was not production grade in my view, right? What I built in front of that was production grade, what I consider production grade server in front of solid. So it was kind of a delegator. It would my my facade, yeah, which was built to my Mastercard Enterprise Security Standards, right? Which is what we all did. Everybody had to do that. And um, that was a facade server that sat in front of solid, kind of protected the solid server from nasties. Okay. But it's certainly on the agenda, obviously, from an Enrupt perspective, to produce enterprise-grade uh, solid implementations. But anybody else can implement, anybody here could implement a, what they consider an enterprise-grade solid server implementation as well, because all you'd be doing is implementing the specs. I, I mean, I, what I can add from my past experience when I was at JP Morgan Chase, there's obviously there's still this no such thing as an enterprise pod or anything. But we were using things like um, Apache Gemma, Allegra Graph, mm -hmm. um, even Mark Logit as they were trying to put support in their XML product. You know, um, whether those environments will come forward and start saying, "Okay, we've got a concept of an enterprise pod," um, I don't know. But I suppose that's partly what in what we're doing. We're looking at the industry and trying to encourage support for it. Yeah, I mean, I could talk about the tech stack that I propose for the end for an enterprise grade. No, solid, enterprise grade solid server. Um, can I do that actually? <laughs> Probably not. Maybe I'll have time tonight. <laughs> let's, let's get another question in. So thanks, off, Fred. Off, off, off. I've, got, I've got a question. Hi, um, my name is Hugh Cloth, and I'm working with Free Labs and banking and various processes. So we talk about the, the pods and the retention of data and then sharing and having the preference to share it with various apps that can subscribe and pull the data. How are you um, controlling or what is the, the handshake there in terms of the retention of the data within the various apps? So, I mean, so if I give a profile of 20 attributes in my data and I subscribe that to five different apps and they, they pull the whole 20 attributes, right? They're now persisting my data. So, how many times do they need to go back to me as a, a golden source for that data set or continue to then become another hub of my data? That is effectively just sharing it as, as they see fit. Yeah. So how are you controlling that? So you can't. It's the answer. Physically impossible. I would argue. <laughs> and the thing is, we have to. Uh, but just one, one, one provider, Sorry, I just wanted to state because you said you're sharing your data, which kind of implies you're, you're, you're giving them your data, a copy of your data, right? I think of it differently. I just phrase it slightly differently. Your, your data should always kind of exist in your pod. And you can grant access to apps to your data. But what's that stop them taking a copy of that? Nothing. But that's the same if you, if you, if you no. share anything with anybody, there's, there's nothing you can do to stop them making no, okay, a photo. No, I, I just was under the impression that there might have been some kind of, you know, time period based agreement or a handshake that was put in place in terms of the contract. Right? So we get, they, we I open it up to apps with the understanding that that, you know, data gets, there's a decay period on it or something to that effect. Okay. And okay. there was also a point mentioned earlier about like, you know, the data has persisted forever. I mean, there's a lot of areas around, you know, control of data and how it's controlled in various countries and where those pods exist That's and, you know, how that data is shared. That's a big area. Has that been addressed? So there's lots of questions in there. Um, the immutability thing is a different uh, capability yeah. from, from, from Maitse. Um, I can just tease apart your questions, so there's multiple mm -hmm. in there. Well, I, I mean, one is, one is across the, the, the movement of data across different countries, I guess, in terms of how that's, how that's been. Go ahead and quick statement. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So, that we have a distinguish between technical, social, and legal challenges. So, as, as technologists myself, I would love to solve it with technology, but that's not the way it works. So, what we're going to do with technology is we're going to make it possible to, to make data flow, we're going to make it possible also to set certain constraints, for instance, yes. App, I'm sharing data with you, but at the moment I've stopped sharing. I mean, you're not supposed to, to have any copies there. However, this is a legal matter, this is a GDPR matter, uh, and they exist as well. So, this is not something we can just solve with technology, it's going to be solved 
talking to lawyers, talking to people from the social science and so on, because you know it's also about mindset as well. So that's no limitations. Yeah, it is fundamentally important. Okay. Paul alluded to it. I think in his introduction about legal frameworks are required in this sphere just as they are in any other sphere. So you need these legal frameworks. <coughs> Mastercard had to engage with a lot of lawyers uh, to deploy, you know, to gain grant access to those multiple um, NGOs, for example. You can't get away from that. Really. No, no, I, I understand that. I'm just, I mean, there's a wider context in terms of obviously if you're asking people to create apps, there's a legal implication maybe in terms of, you know, how you're sharing that data and what the guidelines are around that. Well, no, we see that as a limit of solid or interrupt even. That, that's a business decision, you know, between whatever app wants to use the user's data and the user has to consent to agree to the terms and conditions, that's a, I think. I'm not sure I really understand the question. Okay. I just think there's a governance aspect around it that I'm not sure. Absolutely. I was wondering if it's been addressed already in terms of like, you know, the terms and conditions of using solid, creating an app. And what are the, you know, the parameters within which you can, you know, is it global? You can just make the information, share the information. What are, what are the conditions on, on that share? Right. So, so Solid says nothing about that. Okay. Okay. I don't think we will in the short to medium term, to be honest. I think that's up to the individual applications and the individual uses of the technology. Yeah. I would argue. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's an open point. Yeah, seems to be. Sorry, um, Jim Baird, I'm at Angles. I was just going to pick up on what the other speaker was saying. <coughs> Is it, isn't it part of the model of solid that, you know, within that ecosystem, you know there's a pod owner that your data is secure? The, the purpose of putting it in a pod is to make sure that it can be accessed when needed by people who have permission, but nobody owns it. It must follow, or, or it must seem to reinforce the model that you need a contractual framework around that to make sure that any user of that data is contractually bound not to copy it, duplicate it, and, and store it. So that's true. That's so it has to be a transient access to the. Is, is that is that? Yes, what you're, that is one of the aspects. Yeah. 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 So there's two aspects. Maybe one technical answer to your question is as part of a suite of specifications that define solid, right? One of those specifications is Web ACL, okay, which is Web Access Control Lists. So you're familiar, I guess, with access control lists in general, right? Access control lists, technically. It's just basically just a standard approach to, to controlling access to any resource, be it a file or a file system or a resource over a network, right? And, and all Solid did was take that concept, a very common technical concept, access control lists, and apply it to the web. That's all we did. Okay, so that's one means of controlling access to data that's in the user's control, okay? Web ACLs. So that, that allows a user to say, like, uh, I will grant this individual read access, but I can grant this individual read write and delete access, let's say. I can cre create that access control list and associate it with individuals. So I'm granting those individuals access to my data to do reads or writes or deletes or whatever. Does that make sense? That, 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 but that's just a purely technical implementation of a standard approach to you know, controlling access to resources in computing. ACLs? And then web ACL is just the, the web extension of that. Because remember, so it's all about just being web native and standards based. Yeah? So to address that, that simple technical access control, we just simply took the existing industry standard, you know, extended it to work on the web natively, and that's it. <coughs> Any other questions? Please ask. Yeah, that's, uh, oh, hi, that's. Uh, as a show from uh, uh, most recently HMRC. <laughs> What's our security? Um, question of the originally Tim Berners Lee was doing the semantic web going back to about 2009, 2010. Um, how does this relate to that and the RDF and triple which you've talked a lot about? Oh, did you, did you miss? So, have you come in a bit late? No, no. Oh, sorry, go on. No, yes, sir. Um, so, I did come in a little bit late. Okay. So, Ruben probably explained this better, but my interpretation as an enterprise guy, I'd say that the, the semantic web just got rebranded in 2006. Right as linked data by Tim. So Tim coined the term linked data in 2006, I think it was a TED talk or something. And that is basically just a rebranding of the semantic web. Uh, actually, as I get it now, was that the question you were asking? Yeah, more or less. Um, yeah, because that was one of the problems that I had, um, yeah. is like the, the terminology of what, what the technology was. It, it went from semantic web 
then it was linked data, then it went to open data, and there's, you know, group for the OPR. So, here's a story. The semantic web is a technology stack consisting of RDF, the web, Spark, and so on and so forth. Now, when I started the end of the 90s, actually got really public 2001. That's a semantic web. And after a couple of years, it was 2006, 7, um, we had a chicken and egg problem. Like, it was technology, but there was no data, and you know, there were no apps because there was no data, there were no data because no apps were using it. Um, then Tim started linked data. And linked data is the idea that you just, you know, let's put your data on the web. The apps will come eventually, just get our data there. So that was linked data idea, basically. So let's use semantic technologies to publish data, and then the apps will come. That was back then. Um, apps are really, really common, except that I mean, Google's using it internally, like all the big ones are. But the consumer apps for linked data haven't come yet. There's open data as well, which was part of linked data, like that just publish public data as well. However, Solid, you can basically see as the extension of, of linked data, and there's a semantic web for anything from private to public data. So your data pod, we have to put in there to understand very specifically or very precisely whether it's going to be totally private, totally public, or anything in between. So it's, it's a long continuation. But need, let's forget about some of the burdens of semantic web. This is mainly about the data out there, and it's now solid apps. Everything together is still part of the bigger semantic web. Okay, any more questions? Two, so we just, we'll just do these two and then that's all be it. Off you um, John from uh, Taxi Media. Um, when you're putting data from all, I'm talking about uh, solid, when you're pulling all sorts of data from all over the world basically, what's going to happen with latency? So the advantage of having a centralised database, of course, is that everything's there and it's pretty quick. So do you yeah. optimise it to sort of show certain data first and then the rest Good question. So decentralization does not mean that there can be no central players at all. Decentralization means that the source of truth is with the individual data parts. However, to make this work at scale, we will need aggregators, we will need caching and network and so on. So there is definitely a role for central places to accelerate the whole thing. The difference being that if they disappear, it still works, it's just going to be slow. Whereas right now, if you remove those from the equation, then, then nothing works anymore. So yes, we need infrastructure in the middle, for sure. Like, I, think, I think that's opportunity. When we look at this new architecture, there's going to be all kinds of things that were dealt with previously by centralization. Um, suddenly, there's going to be these gaps. And when we find them, there's an opportunity there. You'd have to have um, CDNs and that sort of thing. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. I was about to say that, um, I think it's publicly shareable, right? That Akamai are one of the major corporations that are actively engaging with it. Oh, okay. Akamai, I don't know if people know, but Akamai are a major corporation that deploy all these CDNs, these content delivery networks. They want to make the web really work at scale, right, to solve this, not solve, but to address to a large degree these latency issues. When you pull, pull a website from Australia, you know what I mean, you pull it once, but then the second time you pull it, if it doesn't change, you, you don't go all the way back to Australia to pull it, you just pull it from whatever your local cache was or your local copy of. It's, it's okay, but, but there are opportunities, in, exactly, and cor major corporations are very interested in. So the last question is... Uh, Eric, um, I'm Kevin, I'm a semantic developer, semantic web practitioner, let's say. Um, I'm curious in the sense of, we can tell that we're at a, we've invented a new world in technology terms, like all blockchain, all the decentralized, there's community being done on that. Uh, I was looking at very popular claims of the WWC, uh, at some point in the past. So, is there any connection between the WTC, considering that team is taking this about for when they did? Or, well, that's a separate thing, but, but absolutely. So, verifiable credentials, it's been renamed, right? So, it's not claims anymore, but anyway. Uh, verifiable credentials is absolutely on our radar. And in fact, there's already an implementation of an earlier draft, often it was called verifiable claims, but anyway, um, uh, already implemented for solid by a researcher at MIT. Okay, but did, has this been created to, uh, you know, to be part of the solid ecosystem? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So it's just another W3C spec, or it's the first part of the W3C spec around verifiable credentials. It's about to go ratification, I think, probably next yeah. month. It's the data model for verifiable credentials. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, we want to support that itself. And actually, in general, like, solid is, as a first approach, just a collection of standards, existing W3C standards, HTTP, LDP, and so on. So other standards, of course, they're going to work together. So there's verifiable claims or credentials. There's also the decentralized identity. So 
we intend to work together with these things like as with the web, this is totally standards driven and we make links to everything else. Yeah. Again, we, we bring that really strong point that fundamental this whole thing is that ecosystem. It's not just solid and solid's approach, you know, it's, it's adopting you know approaches like MadeSafe and IPFS and DLDs. It's really a broader movement than just okay, solid. So there is a division between at least discussion on the level of your IPFS and the DAP protocol. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so um, Right, so I think we've we ran over. What time is it? It's eight fifteen. It's okay. Time. So, so I, I'll call it a day. I've got three big thank yous. Of course, a massive thank you to the speakers. The <laughs> second big thank you, and I should have said this at the start. I had a panic last week of what venue I was going to use because uh, my venue is too small. So MP Group stepped in and picked me up on the LinkedIn. We've got James here and Marios has just uh, shot off. Um, so a big thank you to giving us this space. And then, and then lastly, um, I sort of lost out a little bit here because normally the story goes with the meetup. I think that someone says, oh, when I first started, there was just me and a couple of people and a dog or something. But we've had quite a great turnout tonight, so I'm, I'm really impressed with that. Thanks very much for all your support. So we should give ourselves a, or give yourselves a. <laughs> oh, we should um, also thank MP for there providing the drinks. Oh, yes, MP for also providing the drinks. Thanks very much.